Oh, oh, so can somebody, um, the host disable the, the screen sharing? I'd like for you to, to turn that on, please, Kristen. Yes, I will do that. Just one second. Okay, you should be able to share now. All right. Um, why? Why am I not? Oh, hold on. It's not letting me. Um, it did just a moment ago, very briefly. Yeah, but it was, I, I'm wanting to share my desktop. You might have to click on all, see all um, windows. And there should be a section under share, Aggie, that just says screen. Yeah, share screen, correct? And then just minimize what you're showing and it'll show your desktop. It will. Can you see it? Can you see no. my desktop? No. Yeah? No. Uh, not yet. Are you, did you hit share? Uh-huh. Hmm. hmm. Oh, okay. So basically what I wanted to, uh, I just was hoping to God that this blessed thing worked and obviously it's not. Uh, let me hit share. Okay, let's see. And I'm admitting Michael in. So now oh. can you see? Okay, can we you can, see the desktop? Yeah, we can see, your, we can see your desktop now, yes. All right, so thank you. So I just wanted to start off by, I'm not going to read, there's just about five slides on the on, on this PowerPoint. I'm not going to read it loudly. I'm just going to tell you what the definitions are. And I guess this is what we will be looking at and talking about. And so just a little background on did you know? Oopsie, there you go. And this is my question to you guys. Uh, can you give me an example of how a rubric can be used in say a competition? Or anything apart from academics and assessments and classes, where or how would we use a rubric? Mike, I can't hear you, Michael. Were you going to say something? Anybody? Come on, guys. Just. Um, I know when I was uh, a kid, I participated in something known as Pony Club because uh, I was a, a horse rider. And Pony Club had these different um, levels that you could take a test and have somebody judge your knowledge and your writing ability, and then you would get your little certificate, but they would um, post exactly what you had to do for each level. And so the person who came and judged you on that day that you did your test um, would give you feedback at the end and let you know if you were like above the requirements, met the requirements or below the requirements to see whether or not you, you know, passed the various portions. So that would have been an example, I think, of a, a rubric that you're asking about. I think that's an excellent example, right? Yeah. So we use rubrics for different things and doesn't necessarily have to be for, for, for assessments. We can use it in competitions, like you said, Christian, or if you 
in a cook-off, whatever it is, you have certain standards that you have to, to come up to. And so that being said, I would like to go ahead and share my screen again to, to talk to you about the rubrics that we use as a division uh, for English. But all I'm going to do is one rubric, and I think Michelle is going to do another, and Don and Tanner are going to do examples of a couple of others. And I'm going to show you how to put that rubric into D2L and then trans transfer it to each of your assignments. So <clears throat> let go ahead. Somebody said something? I'm sharing, correct? Am I sharing, guys? Yes, we can see your screen. Okay, so if you went to edit course and there's a, there's a link here and you click on that, D2L has its own template. So what you would have to do is use that template but put whatever you want into it. So the essay grading rubric that I have on here uh, is divvied up into content right here, just a basic thing. And then it's got all these sub, the criteria under content that we will be looking for when we're grading somebody's paper. And then it's got structure and organization. It's got voice and mechanics. Those are the main titles. And then it's got the documentation part of it, okay? So you can add whatever you want, however, what all the criteria that you need for a rubric. And then once you've done that, you go to your assignment screen and just pull it over. Just say, I want it for this paper. What I'm going to do is I am going to edit folder. And there is evaluation and feedback on your right hand side, right? And then you just go ahead and add the rubric. So you go in here because you've already made your rubric. So add existing, pull this, add selected, and then boom, it's right here. Questions so far? Anybody? Anybody? Uh, I know. I noticed the um, when you were showing the actual rubric um, that inside the criteria you were able to have like a table instead of just paragraph text. Um, I was wondering, is that just how you copied it and pasted it into yep. the rubric, and it was yeah, able that's to how that it formatting? Is. Yeah. Yep. That's how our essay grading rubric is. And so that's what I put in. It's sentences. It is sentences, but you can see it right Right, here. but you actually had the lines of the table. Um, when I've copied and pasted before, I've just had the, the text. I haven't been able to keep, you know, keep that within like a table, um, but I ha I'm not sure I've tried. So I, I liked the way that looked. Well, thank you. Uh, and I think this works. And I think it's also accessible because the original rubric is. So be sure, make sure that your rubric is accessible. You can also add it over here on your paper, just in case you want them to see it on your question prompt, you can do that too. Um, so basically, that's what you would do with your paper. Michelle, are you going to do the feedback on the grading? No, I'm showing other options of other kinds of rubrics. You need to show them the feedback on the rubric. All right. So just see. So uh, this is going to be crazy because. Um, I'm just pulling an old paper from somebody somewhere. Okay, so. So 
So when it comes to, oh, why is it not showing me anything? Hold on. Just give it a second. Yeah, wait. I'll, I'll give it a second. Okay. Yeah, you have so to. So when it comes to what we're going to do also is to show you a different way of uh, doing your your um, grading on D2L. You don't have to. I think Yanus or Don's going to also show you a different way of doing it. But you can put comments in here because mm -hmm. when you when your paper is submitted, when they submit the paper. You go into the text box and then you can type what you want in here and you can do your grading that way, your feedback that way. And you can also do what I've done is given them the grading and then I've given extra comments right here on the feedback box. So does anyone use the D2L grading tool? Anyone except apart from the English people? I do. Oh, you do, Marla? Okay. Yeah. How, how have you found it, Doug? You do too? Cliff, Neely. Is it easier for you, Marla? I like it. Um, I can put, you know, the feedback right on the paper, and then I can reiterate that in the in the rubric itself. Right. And then you can also add in that little additional feedback box right because yes. i think the more times you tell them it's easier for them to learn from what what feedback you've given because they're probably not going to read one of the three right or two of the three so so triple force it as much as possible so yeah you use the rubric in your assignment and then you use your d2l tool to grade two questions Anybody have a question? All right, I'm done. Okay, let me do this. Um, can I? Oh, I can. I can. Um, so let me first say that um, <clears throat> um, when I when I was an undergraduate, which was probably what thirty years ago. I can't remember my professors ever using rubrics. Um, they used either these blue books for final exams. You had two or three hours, you had three questions and you had to you know, write in, in a classroom, take that bloody test or they had multiple choice tests. So they basically very rarely engaged in, in using rubrics as ever. I mean, I can't remember in philosophy ever rubrics being used. And I am quite certain that in any other classes as an undergraduate, I can't remember anybody using them. So as a result of it, when I started to teach, you know, whatever, more than 25 years ago, I basically was doing what my professors were doing. Um, I, I, you know, I was trying to mimic my best professors and um, initially what I did was I basically tried to do what I learned in graduate school, namely in seminars, for instance, when we were required to write papers, when I would get my paper back, usually the paper had very few comments, but at the end there was an attached half a page with professor's comments on my paper. And it was a, a proverbial prose. The professor would say, you know, these are your weaknesses, these are your strengths. And on the basis of that, you know, I was supposed to figure it out why I got a particular grade. And <clears throat> when I started to do that, when I started to teach, I realized very quickly that I was running out of time. You know, when you have 120 students and you have to write for every paper, half a page commentary, you very quickly realize that it is taking you a lot of time to write these things. Um, and with time talking to English faculty and complaining, you know, how long it takes me to grade papers. And bear in mind, it still takes me a long time to grade papers. I mean, for me to grade my 
student's paper on average takes me about an hour, an hour and a half. So when I was talking to some of English faculty, they started to talk rubrics. And because I'm not the brightest, so to speak, uh, bulb in the proverbial chandelier, um, it took me probably a couple of years to figure it out that maybe there was a benefit to what they were talking about. And so at some point, in order to at least speed up a little bit that process of grading, I started to do some research on rubrics and very quickly realized that there were definitely clear benefits associated with it. And you know them very well. So, <clears throat> so first of all, it would be wonderful if our students, if you will, could log in into our heads and be able, if you will, to tell what it is that we want out of them. And so before I implemented rubrics, you know, students would ask me questions about how to write philosophy papers. And I am guessing I was not very helpful in that regard. Um, I remember I had a student who, you know, at the end of the semester came to me and, and she was one of my best students ever. And she said to me, you know, I liked your class, but you were useless in terms of explaining how to write philosophy papers. And I venture to say one of the reasons I was useless was that the type of advice that I got from my undergraduate professors was basically go to the bloody library, start reading philosophy articles, and then figure out structures of those papers, and then try to mimic that structure when you are writing those papers. So when I was told that I was useless in terms of teaching my students how to write philosophy papers, I started to think, okay, if I had to explain it, how would I go about doing this? And I remember I spent one summer thinking about the process of writing philosophy papers. And as a result of it, once I started to think about how to explain to my students clearly how to generate these type of papers, I kind of inevitably started to think about rubrics that English faculty were using. And as a result of it, after a while, I basically generated this rubric, which is now quite extensive, that is designed to help students figure out what it is that I'm expecting from them when they are writing their papers. So, <clears throat> you know, as you can see here, Educational scholars talk about rubrics as being beneficial both to faculty as well as students because it enhances communication between ourselves as teachers and our students. So first of all, I realized that when I had to create rubrics for my papers, I started to think much more carefully about the assignments that I was and the expectations from these assignments that I had for my students. Um, I started to think about criteria, if you will, that I wanted my students to meet when they were generating their papers. So that process of kind of developing my rubric for philosophy papers allowed me to think through both my own expectations for my students and also allows my students to kind of understand what it is that I want out of them. And thus, as a result of it, what I did is I basically created, the, created this grading sheet that I give students every time my students get syllabus. At the end of the syllabus, there is this grading sheet attached. And the purpose of that grading sheet is to basically let them know what it is that I expect out of them. Now, when I teach them how to write philosophy papers, I basically tell them that you need to think about philosophy paper as kind of consisting of these building blocks. And if you have all these building blocks, then you have a philosophy paper. Um, I remember taking English classes and I was always confused what it was, what it was that English professors wanted out of me when they were asking me to write essays for them. And I venture to say, if I had to take English class again, composition one, I would probably fail 
because I, I'm always confused what, what, what is the aim, how it is that these papers are supposed to look like. But when I started studying philosophy, I very quickly realized, wow, this is not as hard as in English. It consists of these, again, parts. And if you have all the parts, then more or less you're, you are going the right direction. So as a result of it, if you look at this, again, I, I divided my paper into these parts and students collect, if you will, points. Um, and the purpose of this is not only to students understand how I arrive at the type of grade that I arrive when I grade the papers, but it also is my way of giving them ammunition against me. Um, I always tell my students, if you think that I misgraded you, what I want you to do is to look at my comments, figure out whether you meet or don't meet uh, the expectations of the rubric, and then come to my office and let's argue about your grade. Um, you know, it's not very helpful when a student comes to me and basically says to me, you know, I don't like the type of grade that I got, or I don't understand why I got this grade. Um, because then I can't understand what it is that they don't understand. But if I give them resources that they can use against me, then hopefully maybe they can convince me, if you will, to change their grades. So as a result of it, when I assign points, they know they can see how I assign these points. Now, obviously, they're going to ask now, how do you arrive at this particular point? So, you know, if I say explanation of the issue is, <clears throat> you know, it's unclear, whatever, and I give somebody two points, what does that mean? So as a result of it, I kind of created an additional rubric that is designed to let my students know how it is that I get at the points that I'm assigning for particular parts of their essay. And as they can look at this, and if they think that I somehow misassign these gray and misassign these points, then they can come back to me and say, you know, you say that I don't, I don't know, introduction of the topic. Let's say if, if, if I think that somehow the introduction of the topic in the, in the introduction of their essay is too long or too convoluted or too unclear then they can, they can look at this and figure it out what I was thinking. And then they're able to come back to me and say, you know what, I think this is what you were thinking I was doing, but this is exactly incorrect. And then let me explain to you why. And obviously each part of my paper has the same type of thing, including you know grammar and punctuation and whatever else that pertains to their papers. Um, another part, in order to speed up my grading process, because again, as I, as I mentioned, it takes me every bloody paper, if it is 10, 15 page paper, it takes me about an hour, hour and a half um, to grade these papers. I created these, you know, the, the, this kind of comments that I don't have to write. I use my iPad. I download the paper from D2L. And then I use my iPad in order, to, in order to write these letters, in order to communicate with students. So when they are rewriting their papers, they can figure it out where the problems are. So, you know, if I am asking a question why and they see a letter H, then that information is in a particular part of their paper. So they can look at this and say, okay, he's asking why I am saying this. So what are my reasons? I guess I'm not providing clear enough reasons. And as a result of it, they can, in most cases, they can figure it out what it is that I'm after. Now, sometimes I do have to write particular comments because again, these papers vary as you can tell. So as a result of it, sometimes I do have to ask actual question, but, but in most cases, it shortens, if you will, this process. And, you, and the content comments I have in red, in red ink, and the grammar comments I have 
usually either in black or blue ink, I think in black, since this is here in black. So students can distinguish whether I'm talking about the grammar or, or punctuation, whatever, or whether I am talking about content. Um, and at the end, what I do, this is a kind of, um, you know, a quick way for students to figure it out where are the major problems. These are the parts, this flow chart basically tells students, okay, this is what my essay is supposed to contain. And so I will, you know, if somebody is missing a bloody roadmap, then I will put an X by this. So a student is looking at this and says, okay, he's telling me I don't have a bloody roadmap. So let me go back to my paper and look at the introduction and see whether I have that. Or he's saying to me, I don't have a thesis statement. So let me try to figure it out whether I have a thesis statement or not. So as a result of it, I realized using rubrics that they save me a significant amount of time in terms of grading. Again, I attach this stuff to each paper. Um, and so when I finish grading it, when I email it back to students or I'll send it back to D2L, they can scroll down to the bottom and find this grading sheet. Um, the thing with, if you do a little bit of research, so, so the thing with rubrics is that uh, at this point, there seems to be this general consensus that rubrics are excellent. And being a philosopher, so to speak, um, when somebody says to me that something is excellent and is beyond criticism, you very quickly become suspicious. You very quickly begin to think that it is impossible that something has no problems. And so when you start doing research on rubrics, you very quickly realize that there is a significant body of, call it educational scholarly research, in which educational scholars argue that there are certain problems associated with rubrics. Now, that does not mean that we should get rid of rubrics. To be honest, at this point, I would never get rid of my rubric because again, it saves me a lot of time and it clarifies communication between myself and my students. But I know from experience and actually it's a relatively recent experience that rubrics can undermine the process of education. And let me give you one example. And I was a kind of a guinea pig because I tend to be a lazy man. So when I took AQ, I needed to do it in a week. I was not going to spend an entire semester doing that work. So I, the first thing that I did was I went and looked for the bloody rubrics in AQ in order to know what were the expectations in terms of answers that I was supposed to or questions that I was supposed to engage when doing that program or that class, whatever, however you want to think about it. And I very quickly realized that having their rubrics, which I have to say were excellent, basically saved me at least 50% of time um, because I knew exactly what they wanted. So that meant that when I was looking for through particular modules. I didn't really read everything. I just basically was scanning stuff in order to find relevant information so that I could answer the questions that they were asking. Now, as somebody who was doing this and working full time, these rubrics were wonderful. But in terms of my education, they were basically undermining my education because they were basically telling me how to answer these questions. And I have to say, looking back, and obviously I will never abandon rubrics, but looking back at my undergraduate education and even graduate education, in a sense, I am glad that my professors didn't use rubrics because it forced me the lack of rubrics, so to speak, forced me 
to think much more carefully about what, that, what it was that I was doing, reading, writing, um, you know, thinking about, rather than taking a kind of a rubric shortcut. Um, so, you know, I, I love this stuff. It, it makes it easier again for me to communicate with my students, to communicate my expectations. But I also understand the criticisms, if you will, that one can launch against the use of rubrics. Any questions, complaints, losses? All right, Michelle, uh, who's next? You or me? Uh, I, I guess that's no questions. You, you, you go next. Okay, all right, here we go. I want to first um, just briefly show you my rubric. So here it is. Um, no surprises. It's similar to the ones we've we've looked at before. I give the things that I'm scoring them on and the weights of each. They can get maximum points if they have the minimum number of of problems. So as you can see, how the rubric works works with with sentence level clarity. Fifteen percent of their paper. If they have fewer than three unclear sentences, then they get the full credit. So they'd get 15 points out of 100 for that. And the more problems they have in each of these areas, the lower they go down the, the list here. And so I have an Excel formula that generates a percentage score based on this, uh, the formula provided by these numbers. So that's what the rubric looks like. I don't think we need to look at that in more detail um, unless anybody has questions about how this works. Um, I was thinking from uh, one of the PowerPoint slides that Janos had had showed with the graphic organizer, and then again with your document here, it's reminding me of um, Christy Ferguson's workshop last week on simple language, using plain language to be more student centered. Um, I've not, you know, we normally see the the, the tables, right, with the excellent, you know, on that scale of four to one. I really love how simple you've done it with just the, the points and then the sentence. I really think this is very student friendly. Well, thank you. And it, it's instructor friendly as well, because before I had something like this, it was it was more difficult when I got into arguments like Janusz likes to have about grades to to justify it and to explain why the the, the clarity problems in this paper merited it scoring a C instead of a B. But now it's just very quantifiable. I can point, I can say, here's unclear sentence one, two, three, four, five, six. That's why you got a two out of four. So it, it, it's, it helps both of us, I think. So this is what it looks like when it's blank. When I send it back to them, it just has the, the numbers here circled and the percentage score. The back page has a bunch of things like formatting requirements. If they happen to plagiarize or go too long or too short, I can circle things or underline them here um, to convey that information. I really want to spend most of my time talking about uh, my grading process, which has evolved and, and is, is still evolving, but I want to show you its, its current iteration. Back, back in the day when I first started teaching, you know, a long time ago, um, it was easy because students would hand me a stack of printed papers and I could write on them and hand them back to them and and that worked really well and so I I've tried to retain in my current grading process that element because I, I find that I concentrate better I learn more so much about what I'm doing intellectually is better for me if I'm if I'm in writing things to actually be writing with my hand as opposed to typing so I want to be able to write on the papers with my hand. Um, I think it's a lot more efficient, it, at least it is for me. I haven't tried the D2L um, in shell grading in, in a year or two. It may be better than it used to be, but back when I tried it um, initially, 
it was just so clunky. It took so long. I mean, I wanted to put one little comment like this is unclear and it would be, you know, three clicks and maybe a type. And I, I wanted to not be subject to that laborious process. So driving force for migrating process number one is to retain the handwriting um, and not have to click and drag and drop. I also want to convey as much information as possible in as little time and with as few markings as possible. We want to get through these papers fast. Now, I know that there's a bit of a debate about how much feedback to give students on essays, how many problems in their writing to point out. I know there's a strong argument for focusing on some small number of problems that's more manageable for a student. Um, that's not my approach. I I will mark every problem that I see. If a sentence has 15 punctuation problems, I will mark all of them. Part of the reason for that is that I just on principle think that that's my job. I, I want students to improve as much as possible. And so I want to show them every possible place in their writing that they can improve. I know that sometimes with traditional scoring practices that can look overwhelming because there's too much text on the page. I try to uh, solve that with the process I'm about to show you. Um, also, the way my scoring works, if I were to only show students a couple of problems in their first writing submission, the problem is that I give them feedback on their first one. They use that to improve the text and incorporate it in their subsequent writing assignments because they build on one another. And if I only show them a couple of problems in the first one, if they only fix those and then they resubmit the same text that has a lot of additional problems that I didn't point out, then they're going to have scoring hits for those later, and that would seem unfair. Why didn't you show me these before? So that's why I try to mark everything I can possibly see. Um, the central, the, the Rosetta Stone, the, the secret to this is similar to something Yana showed you, and it's it's the it's my, my scoring key, which is on the on the screen now. And I got props a minute ago for nice plain language. I have not run this through the plain language test. I'm certain it would fail. I'm going to work on that. I didn't have time to do it before this presentation. Um, it, it's wordy, but once a student masters it, I, I find it very effective. I'm not going to read all these these words to you. The top half of the page just explains my idiosyncratic markings that I make with my hand on their paper. X's, wavy lines indicate awkward phrasing. Question marks indicate um, unclear phrasing. X's indicate false statements. But then when it comes to mechanical problems and, and a number of others, I have a list. This is similar to what Yana showed you with the letters. I, I have numbers. So you can see number one is comma splices. If you have a comma splice, you will see a number one on your text somewhere. So what this looks like when students get their paper back, for example, here's a paper on abortion. I'm able to show students so many problems with their writing with very few markings and if I were to write all of this and put text for all of this, this a student I would think would see it and just go, this guy's such a jerk. I, I can't even see my, my own text anymore because he's written so much. So I use the numbers. Nine. Nine is don't confuse possessives and plurals. Eighteen is you got one term in the plural and another in the singular. Twelve is watch your spacing. Two is a comma problem. Uh, Twenty-five, is this really the word you want here? So what they're going to have to do is see, OK, 25. What the heck is 25? I need to go back to the list. Oh, 25. Is this the word you want here? And as you'll see, if you read this sentence, that is not the word the person wants here. <laughs> so this is the process that I use. It's numbers. And the numbers tell me a lot, too. I look at this and I see that most of the numbers are under 20. That tells me that the student's main problems are mechanical, punctuation, grammar, that sort of thing. Um, note that I do, if I'm going to say something nice, I actually write it. I don't want to have a number for good point or well put because I don't want that to get lost. I want the criticisms to look small and insignificant, and I want the praise to be obvious and prominent. So that's why I write well put. Um, one more example of what this looks like when I hand it back to students. Different kinds of markings here. You'll see wavy lines. That's awkward phrasing. Um, you'll notice that the numbers on this page are mostly above 20. Mo numbers above 20 indicate not mechanical problems like punctuation, but 
kind of more difficult problems to explain to students and for them to see unclear phrasing, awkward phrasing, things like that. But you can go back to my scoring key and you'll see that these numbers represent those things. And I will have a meeting with the students after their first assignment. We will talk through these markings. Uh, if, if they don't see how their phrasing is awkward or unclear, I'll be able to explain. We'll work it through together. Going forward, at the end of the term, I'll get the same text back, but it won't get any markings because all the problems will be fixed and it will get a great grade. Um, okay. I, I, I'm, I'm going to forgo showing the logistics of how I get to this point. It, it's, it's pretty quick. Um, I'll just, I'll just show them um, the list on the screen. I require my students to submit their papers in PDF. Pull out my iPad, go into D2L, download the paper to my Notes app, like one click. Open Notes, bring the paper on my screen, score it with my Apple Pencil, upload it to Dropbox. You could use OneDrive. Email it to my student, attaching it to the email from the Dropbox. I used to, per, I like writing on paper so much and hate using the other method that I would write on paper, scan it, and email it to the student. It took forever. This takes seconds. Okay, I'm finished. Uh, I, I guess I have one minute for questions. That's fantastic. Thank you, John. All right, cool. Oh, Just, Doug. Uh, track, we've got it's 1044 and I know we still have one more person, but Doug, you have a question for Don. Yeah, just a real quick question. Um, how do you know that they're other than improvements in the future? How do you know that they're referencing your key? Because the idea of a key is a cool idea. I don't. I mean, I, I don't. And and sometimes they don't. I mean, I'll get comments at the end of the semester that say, you know, I, I, this guy never explained why he took points off my paper. I'm like, well, I did, but you just didn't listen. <laughs> no, I'm sorry. I, I can't ensure that they consult the key, but I do um, encourage them to repeatedly and with vigor. Okay, take it away, Michelle. Okay, um, let me share. I'm just going to real quickly show you a couple of other um, um types of rubrics um, that, let's see if I can get this done. A couple of other types of rubrics that you could be using um, and talk real quickly about those. So um, I think the one that people see most often and Yunish kind of had one that kind of looked like that, but we're, we're used to seeing the analytical rubric that is that one that's fully filled out. So you have your criteria, you have your meets, exceeds, something about not not there yet and something about un, unacceptable or whatever. And you score that um, each criteria separately. Um, so for the analytic, um, it definitely takes the most time to, um, to make these analytic ones. Um, but it's kind of nice because you can weigh each criteria separately. So like you could add, you could make this 50% and this only 20%. Um, so it, it adds a little bit of flexibility in that respect, in the way that you can create, you can, um, you can calculate your grades. Um, that could also be, um, you know, you could make this each each thing like 20 points, 15 points, 10 points, or you could do ranges like 10 to 20 points, um, five to, to 10 points or whatever. So different ways of using an analytical rubric, but that's what the typical one looks like. Um, I kind of like the single point rubrics where you just put the meet standards in the middle and then it's left spaces blank where you can write, you know, targeted um, feedback to the students on what they exceeded and what they didn't quite make. So that's another form of rubric that you can use a little less crowded if you don't like the table form that's so crowded. Um, of course, that means 
there's minimal language. It takes less time to create. Um, it's really good because you can give targeted feedback, but it does require more writing on the professor in the grading time. So that one has some ups and downs too, but another way that you might want to think about having a rubric. And the last and the easiest one that you've seen, I'm sure, is the holistic rubric. And you could just have four or five categories. Um, basically, just the performance level um, saves time because there's not as many decisions to be made as in like the analytical. Um, it also tends to be pretty um, reliable because it's it, there's so little choices. Um, again, you could have this be 20 points, this be 15, this be 10, and this be five. Or you could have these be ranges. This could be 21 to 25. This could be um, you know, 15 to 20 or whatever. So different ways you could do this. This might be better on a smaller assignment where you want to grade something really quickly and just have a quick little rubric to, to use it on. Um, but like our like Aggie showed you at the first, our English one is is built on an analytical which is a fully filled out one. That's the, the English rubric we have is an analytical one that we all use in our grading um, with range of numbers. So there, there's a lot of flexibility with rubrics and a lot of different ways that you can use them in your classes. Um, so I encourage you to think about what you might wanna do with a rubric and, and the, the Office of Online Learn, Learning can help you make it in D2L and attach it to your assignments if you need help walking through that. They're real good at that. They, they helped me set up mine several semester go, semesters ago when I first did it. And basically in D, D2L, every, all of my assignments have a grading rubric attached to them and it makes my grading so much faster and easier. So I really encourage you to try it out if you hadn't. Um, just a few more minutes for general questions for any of the four of us, anybody? So Michelle, mm -hmm. uh, we can use these rubrics, right, for or for other different forms of assessment, like journal writing and discussions and stuff. Of course, right? so we've got discussion rubrics too that are simpler. Um, it, like my discussion rubric just has like two levels. One is for their main response, and it has like five levels, and then one for their responses to other students and has like five levels. So it's two clicks to grade my discussion rubric. Yeah. And I think Don and Yanus also have a discussion rubric. Yeah. Yeah. That's a great point. Um, it is 1050. So we have come to the end of the scheduled time, although I believe um, our panelists will hang around if there are some additional questions. I uh, just wanted to request that everybody complete the post survey link that was posted in the chat to give our um, teaching center and our panelists some feedback about how they did today. Um, coming up next at 11 is our Office of Online Learning is providing some information about the new accessibility tool. Um, it's also got the video stuff, which I missed the other day, but he, this next one at 11 is focusing on the accessibility tool. So uh, you might want to check that out. And then again at 12, we have uh, Robert Ladd talking about how to um, keep students' cameras on. So we'll be having a discussion uh, at 12 about that topic. That's, oh. that's me. Yeah, I'm just the moderator. Oh, <laughs> sorry. Excuse me, Aggie. You're right. I reading the, the name in bold stood out and that was the moderator's yeah. name. Sorry. Yeah, so um, Aggie is going to present on the um, ways we can keep kids, uh, students engaged uh, virtually. So those are things coming up. Um, so. We have come to the end, uh, but if anybody wants to hang out for a minute and ask any questions, please do so. Or of course, make any comments.